There's a sister way back there. She knows I need to work on Yeah, that's life. right, exactly. Testing, testing. Uh, just that the eight basic laws just really, and the Bible, just fall into what the world has shown mm -hmm. is correct. And I really like that walking or exercising mm -hmm. can help your mind because mm -hmm. right now we can't remember so well. It mm -hmm. seems like our just is so deteriorating. So we have something we can do is exercise That's for right. these problems. Love yeah. that. So everything that ends up getting empirically validated in the social sciences that is helpful to people for emotional health is pretty much traceable back to scripture, at least everything I've shown so far. The morning meetings that I'm doing from 13 Weeks to Joy are different windows into subjects, topics that have been explored in the social sciences, and they're all things that I was like, well, this is biblical. Like, the last one is about worship. There's tons of research that shows that the experience of awe is psychologically and even morally beneficial to people. There's tons of research to that effect. I love that because it's biblical and because the Lord told us to have awe, stand in awe of him. Go ahead, sister. I remember um, yesterday that you talked about sleep, yeah. setting a time that you would get up yeah. regardless of how much time you have yeah. slept. Yeah. And I'm going to put that into practice. Yeah, get up so that you don't oversleep because if you oversleep, then you'll have trouble falling asleep the next night. Yeah, very good. Anybody else? Sister back there? Yeah, I'm doing the women's meeting for at 10 o'clock in the 10 morning. 10 a.m. It is not. It just says women's ministry online. It's correct, but our program just says women's ministry. Apologize How do you like that? Boy. Yeah, but you can come. I'm going to do three more. Two more? Three more. Uh, two. Two more. Two more. <laughs> okay, I have a, a couple. Okay. Uh, the tummy rest. Tummy rest. I like that one to rest mm -hmm. the tummy. In fact, my husband and I were, uh, he, I shared that with him, and he mm -hmm. goes, yeah, that's going to be tough. We, re we eat right up into the time we close our eyes because <laughs> that's a lot of time only time we have a chance to mm -hmm. to eat in the evening yeah but then also from this morning uh post-traumatic uh, growth growth mm -hmm. i love that and that's encouraging that uh, it means that trauma doesn't wreck you forever and ever amen that there's something you can do in response to it that'll make a difference very good thank you oh, sorry sweetie excuse me sorry yes um yes. go ahead Margaret. <laughs> <clears throat> the uh, bright light in the eyes mm -hmm. 10 minutes after you get up in mm -hmm. the morning yeah uh, what what all that does to the brain and, yeah and for healing that you you're encouraged by that huh? oh I, I just wish I knew how to make that happen for me <laughs> because I, I have problems with my eyes I have oh problems. well apparently you don't have to ha even have your eyes open so it's getting your eyeballs out there where the bright, of course, never look directly at the sun, but it's getting that bright light even if you don't have, um, you know, what are you, you have, can't see very well or? Yes. Okay. Well, I don't think it would matter. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's, I live in, in the trees, so oh. when, they're, when they're for a leaf, I don't get the sunshine. At How, far, you can't walk out or there's no place? No, but isn't there a little spot you can go that's got sun coming in? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to be praying about it. Okay, okay. You find yourself a spot. You should be. And if you can't, then get a happy light. And just use that first thing in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, besides that, that she was just talking about, mm -hmm. the water for the restless legs mm -hmm. might be life changing. I'm oh, I hope so. It was life changing that. for me. Amen, sister. Let me know. Reach out to me if it helps you. I would like to hear about it. And you can reach out even if it doesn't help, I'll, you know. <laughs> <laughs> After so much all day long, I went to bed, and I'm falling asleep at the last meeting, but I get in the bed, and then I'm not asleep. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, no. And I thought, okay, little mouth, blow it. Okay. 
Yeah. And so I did that several times, and I did. I fell asleep. <laughs> I'm the tosser and turner, and so I last night was doing the toss and yeah. turn. I said, no, Jennifer said, be still. Yeah. And so I just was still, and I don't remember anything else before <laughs> going to sleep. So. Love it. It's awesome. You know, sometimes we get uh, mm -hmm. so tired that we can't shut down because your parasympathetic response also requires energy. Yes. So there's such thing as nervous exhaustion where you're so tired that your parasympathetic is like, and it has to actually do something to shut you down. So if you're that tired, sometimes it can be really hard. Um, I'll get in the bathtub with uh, Epsom salts magnesium in that bathtub and that gets absorbed through your skin and that can be helpful. Yeah, and then drinking lots of water. And usually eventually that'll kind of get the nerves to function again. <laughs> but yeah, you can get so tired you can't sleep. It happens, it happens to me a lot. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I was gonna say also, I really like how you said even if you drink water at night, you were still getting up. I found that to be true too because mm. people would say not to drink in the evening. Mm -hmm. I have not found it any difference if I drink or not. I get up the same, so mm -hmm. I enjoyed hearing that. That's me. I, um, I don't think it's the fullness of your bladder. I think it's other things that make you feel like you have to relieve yourself. So I've not had any problems with hydrating in the evening. Yeah. Hello. Um, Hi. So mm -hmm. yesterday you talked about the breathing technique, breathing yeah. in and holding it and mm -hmm. breathing out. Mm -hmm. And I am a bicyclist, and this morning I went for a bike ride. And it Oh, this be, is a great place to ride bikes. It's, it was wonderful. Yeah. It's beautiful. And hills can be intimidating, and we were discussing yeah. that breathing technique. Mm -hmm. And when you slow yourself down and are mindful of your thoughts and mm -hmm. just how your body is being in rhythm, um, it really helps to give you strength to, you know, I do distance and um, it's very useful. I'm going to really incorporate it more. So that is so that. great. I never thought of doing it for biking, but I bike too. And it's, yeah, you can get challenged with going up hills, but I'll have to try the deep breathing. Excellent. Excellent. Um, what do we got? Someone back there? Is there a hand up? I'm missing. Is there a hand back no, there? No, there's not. I was just Anybody? Strong. All right. Everybody said everything they want to say? One more. Before I start saying things? Oh, we've got another. Okay. Pastor Al. No? Anyone? Yes, right here. Okay. Yeah, I, I think you mentioned something about water. I saw something two to three uh -huh. words. But yeah. then the comments here which were made, I missed it, that yeah. you can drink water all day long and... Uh, not on the bathroom or something like that. Can you repeat that again? Yeah, we were just saying that sometimes people stop drinking water in the evening, or I used to, but what happened is because my blood volume would be lower and I'd be slightly dehydrated, I would end up getting uh, dehydration triggered restless leg syndrome. So I started raising the amount of money, uh, money, water, <laughs> money that I was spending, no, water that I was drinking in the evenings, and that took away the restless leg. I don't really have a problem with it if I stay hydrated. And it didn't make us get, she just said, and I said, didn't make us have to get up and use the bathroom any more often. How, many, how much do you drink in the evening? Well, I think you should drink at least two quarts during the day, but I'll drink probably between five and bedtime, I'll drink at least another half a quart. I would say not a lot. I'm not going to drink a quart of water and then go to bed. That would that'd be asking for trouble. <laughs> yeah. She says that in the morning. Really? All right. Well, show me. Wait, I would like to see that. Huh. All right, I'll have to see that. I know she says in the morning drink lots. And I do that. I wake up in the morning. It's the first thing that goes into my system is lots of water. And it's a very good habit, and it tends to purge everything out, and it's really wonderful. All right, anybody else? 
Okay, thank you for chatting. I really appreciate it. Well, let's talk, and you'll have some more time at the end to weigh in if you wish to. We're going to start getting into the psychology of anxiety and depression, because as I read, I believe it was yesterday, or no, it was the first day, I read the psychologist that said that he thought the roots of depression were primarily psychological, because people say, oh, you know, it's in your genetics, it's in your lifestyle, and they can sometimes oversimplify a complex problem. Even with medication, a self-respecting therapist who prescribes or encourages their client to go on medication will tell them that they need counseling as well. Physicians that prescribe antidepressants for their patients will tell them you need counseling as well. That is the gold standard is both the improvement of brain chemistry and the dealing with your thought life. So we're gonna talk about the thought life during this session to try to get a grip on the gold standard treatment for depression in terms of counseling. So there's an expression, don't believe everything you think. Can you want to hear something about my husband? This will, all right, do you, do you want to? I mean, should I tell you? Okay, all right, you, you, I warned you. So anyway, um, he, we, I got a plaque from a friend that said this on it. It's a great maxim of cognitive management. And so you should believe everything you think because some of your thoughts are irrational. Good point. I put it on the wall in my office and my husband wrote the word idiot on a post-it note and put it over think. So it said, don't believe everything, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Just gives you an idea what my life is like on a daily basis. I walked into the office, you know, come in, sit down, Mrs. Smith, and help me, let me help you. And it says, don't believe everything, you idiot. No, anyway. We're getting a good picture. Yeah. So this is a wonderful statement from the writings of inspiration. She says, if the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. Isn't that concise and incisive and direct and simple? If the thoughts are wrong, what happens? The feelings are wrong. And then she goes on and she says, the thoughts and feelings combined make up moral character. Now, I could do a whole session. I could do a whole seminar on that one phrase, thoughts and feelings combined make up. What does that mean? Well, it's hopeful in that just because you have a random irrational thought doesn't mean that's who you are. And just because you have a wacky emotion, that's not who you are. But there's something about the intersection between thoughts and feelings that really gets to the core of who we are as human beings. And it's really fascinating to study brain science because there's things like your limbic system, which is basically the house of your feelings, and the cerebral cortex, which is basically the house of your thoughts. And there's a, an organ that connects the cerebral cortex with the limbic system called the anterior cingulate cortex. And there's something to me very wonderful and mysterious about that organ and the circuits that it creates because it connects the emotions with the thoughts. And it gets the brain to sync up as a whole. Like I talked yesterday about not believing what you feel, but then ultimately correcting your thoughts and then feeling what you believe. And so that anterior cingulate cortex circuit between the cerebral cortex and the limbic system is a really important function of the brain and it's one we want to get going. We want to ultimately feel what we believe as long as it's grounded in scripture, right? Yes. We want that. Well, interestingly enough, the deep breathing exercise I gave you yesterday, was that yesterday or today? It was yesterday. I'm just getting so disoriented. I'm up here talking all day. I forget what I said when. I hope you guys feel sorry for me. So anyway, <laughs> That deep breathing exercise, it's called conscious breathing in behavioral science, that activates the anterior cingulate cortex. Now, when I first started doing the Jesus meditations, I had a 30-day challenge, and we would talk about it and everything, and we'd have these groups on Zoom, and we'd talk through. And there was a woman, I don't know where she is, I forgot her name, but she said in one of the meetings that she was doing that breathing and the Jesus meditation along with it and she said, for the first time in my life, my limbic system connected to my cerebral cortex. <laughs> and I was like, how do you know? And she was like, well, I felt what I believe for the first time in my life. So the things that I'm sharing with you are not only gobbledygook from the field of psychology, but they are 
wonderful mysteries of how the brain works, at least some of them, and may be very helpful. So anyway, let me keep reading this. Thoughts and feelings combine to make up the moral character. If you yield to your impressions and allow your thoughts to run in a channel of suspicion, doubt, and repining, you will be among the most unhappy of mortals. Now, little honesty here. How many of you have allowed your thoughts to run in a channel of suspicion, doubt, and repining? Let's take each one of those. Suspicion is typically oriented toward other people, right? So, she doesn't like me, I can just tell. Like, she's just got this thing. And I bet she talked to that other person that, and I bet that person told her that thing that I know isn't true, but is sort of partly true, but then she twists it, and she's friends with her, and I bet she told her about that suspicion right there. Anyone else here? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nothing. So that's one thing we do. Doubt wondering if God loves us, wondering if we have any value at all, when there's abundant testimony to that fact. And then repining is looking back and feeling regret or complaining about the way things are. So if we allow our thoughts to run in those channels, we're going to be unhappy. It's just like A plus B equals C. And I can testify that I lived this. I know I have a lived experience in this, allowing my thoughts to run in the channels of suspicion, doubt, and repining, and being very unhappy. So the million dollar question is, how do you get out of that pattern? So I'm gonna give you something that I wrote, I mean, I've developed, that I've been using for the last 15 years, called FAR. Think about these negative thoughts being far from you, okay? And these negative experiences far from you. Uh, we wanna take it in three steps. First of all, you want to find then you want to argue in cognitive behavioral studies, this is called forceful disputation. You want to learn a healthy way of challenging yourself or of arguing with your own irrational tendencies. Not in a sick way, but in a healthy way. Like Bob Dylan said, I'm going to give myself a good talking to. He actually wrote that into a song. I think that's something we need to do. It's like sit ourselves down sometime and say, self, what you're doing to yourself isn't good. And then other people are getting tapped out by it. So self, let's, let's have a little chat here. So that's the argue part. And the third part is replacing that irrational thought with the truth. Now, just to break it down a little further, that first step actually breaks down into three steps. So the first of the three steps, and I'm sorry I don't have this on a slide, but the first of the three find steps is you find the experience. Almost invariably, that experience is the easiest thing to find. What, what got you to be upset? What was the traffic jam? Or my husband wasn't very nice to me. Or I got a stomach ache. Or I found out I gained five pounds. Or I looked at myself in the mirror and the lighting was such that I just couldn't believe how much I'd aged. Or whatever, you know, it was a humid day and my hair went haywire. Whatever bothered you or a friend betrayed you or you were confronted with evil in another human being or something worse, you know, you trace to that event that upset you. And that's usually pretty easy. Yeah, I am upset, this happened. Then the second thing you wanna find is your emotions. So we've been talking about labeling your emotions. What did I call that yesterday? Something labeling. You remember the tarantula? Okay, what is it called? Blank labeling. Affect labeling, thank you. So we're gonna label our emotion. We're gonna find what is that emotion that I'm feeling. That's usually a little harder. And now the really hard part is identifying the thought. So what I recommend is that you give the feeling a voice and let it talk to you. And it'll say things. That's your thought. You wanna identify that. Now I'm gonna develop that a little more in the future, but those are the first three steps of find, or the three steps that are in find. And then arguing is identifying the ways in which you are thinking irrationally. And in order to do that, we need to look at distorted thoughts. Now, there are many lists of distorted thought styles online. I have a more comprehensive list in the anxiety and depression relief materials, but these are just some of them, okay? Some of the most common. So they are things like catastrophizing, 
making something much worse than it really is. You know, proportionality is a big part of rational thinking, of maturity, and of being a sensible human being. It's okay to be upset if you get delayed for five minutes in a traffic jam, but it isn't the end of the world. It's okay even to have a little bit of tension in a relationship, but your entire, entire social sphere isn't coming apart at the seams. Think proportionately. It's okay to have a couple of you know, spats with your spouse, but it doesn't mean divorce. It means you had a spat, spat with your spouse, and of course you're a little upset about it. That's normal. So make sure that you're proportionate. Catastrophizing isn't. And I told you guys yesterday about the mind reading, because I was mind reading someone that was looking weird at me from the audience of, a, of a, or the congregation where I was preaching, and I thought I knew what he was thinking. I didn't know what he was thinking. So don't think you know what people are thinking. You may have an intuition about it, but you know, the limbic system is very good at impressions and sort of general information and feelings, but it's not good at precision. So make sure you don't think you know precisely what another person is thinking because you may have a hint of something, but you don't know exactly what it is. Negative filtering is suppressing the positive information in your life and bringing out the negative. You ever seen that happen? How many of you do that? Where you focus on the negative. Overgeneralizing is taking one trait and generalizing it to the whole person. It comes across in things like, oh, he's such an idiot or he's such a terrible, you know, he's just a, He's just a narcissist or whatever you say that just labels a person where you take one trait and that's the sum total of who they are. Dichotomous thinking is thinking in black and white. And this is very, very prevalent on social media. There's a lot of vilification of bad people on social media. They're racist, they're sexist. They're this, they're narcissist, they're that. There's a tendency to villainize and criminalize people and overgeneralize maybe some bad traits they have. And then there's the innocent good people over here. So there's typically actually three categories. There's the good guys, uh, the innocent people, the hero, and they're the good ones, and then the bad guys. Social media thrives on creating distinctions like that because the human brain responds more quickly to that kind of oversimplified information. The more detailed and nuanced something is, the more it takes to engage our minds. And so we have to struggle and we don't like to work very hard cognitively. So social media takes advantage of people's cognitive laziness and makes things emotionally exciting without being carefully thought through. So black and white thinking. I remember being on campouts as a kid. We're either gonna have fun on this campout or we're not. And then things would happen, like the bears would get in our food and, and I got a tick once on my stomach, a tick. And the camp director heard that the way that you get rid of a tick is you light a match and you hold it on the tick. But he forgot about blowing it out. So my, all my friends watched while he made me stick my stomach out as far as I could, and then this tick is there, and then he takes a lit match, and I'm just like sucking it, you know, like, it was the funniest thing. But of course, it was, a, it was a crazy camping trip, and it wasn't all fun, but I sure got a lot of good memories, right? Um, shoulds is looking at people and at events through should glasses. Think of the people at church or the people in the different offices. The person in this office should be this. The greeter should be friendly, you know. And that's okay to have standards. But if that's the lens through which you look at everything, and you never say, look, the greeter should be friendly, and she just looked at that guy like he was an alien, what can I do about this to make it better? If you never go there, and you're constantly analyzing things for what they should be, then you're gonna get yourself in a negative space. Okay, personalizing, taking on yourself, things that belong to other people. Blaming is putting on other people, things that belong to you. Unfair comparisons is comp comparing yourself to other people when they have advantages you don't have, and putting yourself down because of that is usually the way it plays out. The Bible says they that compare themselves among themselves are what? Wise. Not wise. And then emotional reasoning we have talked about. How many of you know what emotional reasoning is? It's looking at your emotions as standalone evidence as to whether something is true. 
And if I feel sad, it must be a sad world. If I feel unloved, I must be unloved. If I feel guilty, I must be guilty. I've seen Adventists get really sick because they overvalue that sense of conviction or guilt and they end up thinking that all guilty feelings are necessarily a signal that they have done something wrong. You know what, guys? We know the end time scenario. We know that we will be told that the plagues that are falling are our fault because of our silly Sabbath. That's gonna trigger our guilt reflex. I'm just saying, human beings can shame each other and they can cause emotional responses in each other. And if we're gonna go on feelings alone as to whether we are guilty or not, we're gonna cave in. So we need to learn to resist false guilt as much as we need to learn to accept true conviction. Does this make sense? And Adventists are great at just having guilt complexes because we have so many standards and so many things we're supposed to be doing. All right, so I wanna go a little deeper with you on how to get to the core of our distorted thinking. Because sometimes what happens is people try these cognitive behavioral exercises and they keep having these distorted thoughts. So think of it as a water table. When you've got a water table, it keeps percolating up. You wanna drain the swamp, so to speak, and get that whole area completely drained out. So sometimes you have to go deep. So I like to use the acronym PLAIN, P-L-A-I-N. Permission, label, area, intensity, and noun. I'm sorry, narrative. Okay, so here's what you're gonna do. Is the first step is, if you're working with another person, you ask permission. Can we stay with that feeling for a moment? Because people will say, I don't know what I think, I just feel. So you say, can we stay with that feeling for a moment? And you get their permission. And then label that emotion, so they affect label. And then the third step is, in what area of your body do you feel it? Then they have to step back and observe their experience from a distance. So they go, oh, I'm feeling it in the pit of my stomach, or I'm feeling it in my throat, or I'm feeling it in my chest. And then what intensity do you feel it? Rating from one to 10. Oh, it's about an eight. I'm feeling pretty intense right now. And then the last step is narrative. What would that feeling say if it could talk? And specifically, what would it say about the future? What would it say about yourself? And what would it say about God? And what would it say about other people? All right, so get a shot of that, and I'll show you what it looks like, kind of. All right, so let's take Samantha. Samantha's a young lady. She's in college, and she's in a graduate program. She's always been a great student, high achiever, but suddenly she's been seized with anxiety symptoms, and she's doing terrible. And she's almost to the point where she's having to drop out of her classes. It's very bad. She goes to see a counselor. The counselor teaches her cognitive behavioral exercises, but it doesn't seem to be helping very much. Oh, we lost, okay, there we go. So she's having distorted thoughts like, those people think I'm stupid, what would that be? What would that be? They think I'm stupid, what would that be? Suspicion. Mind reading, good. And then he got into Yale and I didn't, I'm a loser, what would that be? Comparisons, right? And then I should have stayed up all night to study, what would that be? Shoulds, that's right. Either I get an A or I fail, that's what? Black and white thinking, very good. I feel like a loser, I must be a loser, what's that? Emotional reasoning. And so she learns these cognitive behavioral exercises and she corrects those things, but it doesn't seem to be getting deep enough so what the therapist does is the therapist starts asking a series of questions about her past. And this is kind of where trauma and our thought life intersect, because sometimes our life experiences are what give us these core beliefs, right? So the therapist starts to talk to her about her childhood, and she learns that her mother had to drop out of her doctoral program when she got pregnant with Samantha. And the mother was so crushed and disappointed that she could not pursue her career of her dreams that she lived her life vicariously through her daughter and therefore told her daughter every moment of her life from the time she could think that you have to be the best. And so Samantha incorporated into, very deeply into her core belief system that she had to be the best, not that she had to be her best, but that she had to be the best. I have to be better than everybody else. 
was the core belief that was causing all the problems. And Samantha was, by the grace of God, able to revise that core belief into, yes, I have to do the best I can. I have to be my best, but I don't have to be better than everyone else. And as soon as she was able to let go of that, then those distorted thoughts kind of calmed down. Does that make sense? Getting to the core issue? Okay. So let's talk about trauma and how it factors into all of this because often the life experiences we have can set us up for certain distorted thought styles. You know, I see it this way, that when people have a life trauma, particularly when they're very young, it's almost as if trauma softens the brain and the enemy is right there to speak through the traumatic event or just to be there to strongly suggest certain distorted thought styles. So say for instance, kid is just going along in life and all of a sudden his mother disappears and is left with his dad. This is a real client and mother's just gone. What kind of thoughts is that immature brain going to come up with? Well, nobody will ever stay with you. I can never be secure, especially with women or whatever. They're going to develop certain core beliefs that are so deep they don't even know that they have them. They're pre-verbal because the individual was pre-verbal when they developed them, when they had the trauma that caused it. So what happens as a result of that, and we talked a bit about PTSD this morning, so I don't want to belabor PTSD too much, but basically people end up in survival mode where their brain is over-functioning, their limbic system is over-functioning because they're not safe. I want to just briefly touch on CPTSD CPTSD is a type of post-traumatic stress disorder that happens as the result of accumulated small assaults on the nervous system of that person, typically in childhood. Did I, how many of you are here this morning? Okay, most of you are here this morning, so I don't want to review material that um, we've already uh, reviewed, but let's look at a statement that Vincent Felitti made. He said, our study of the relationship of adverse childhood experiences to adult health status in over 17,000 persons showed addiction to be a readily understandable, although largely unconscious, attempt to gain relief from well-concealed prior life traumas by using psychoactive materials. In other words, they're self-medicating to get rid of the distress caused by these childhood experiences. And here's that adverse childhood experiences scale. Um, let me see here. Hang on, okay. Just want to go forward a little bit. I'm going to run through some of this stuff pretty quickly because we've covered it already in other meetings. So Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote The Body Keeps the Score, says, trauma actually changes us physically, becoming encoded in our nervous systems and changing the way our body responds to things. He sees in people with CPTSD, which is this kind of trauma that's created because of accumulated small traumas, as having the same set of symptoms that we see in legitimate PTSD. Things like self-blame, distrust, inability to function well, attention problems, difficulty regulating emotions, and difficulty with relationships. By the way, I want to talk briefly, and I didn't talk about this this morning, the trauma therapies that work. Because if you are someone who experiences PTSD, or even CPTSD, these are not incurable conditions. These are conditions that do respond to treatment. So I've done a bit of research into this, and the three treatments that are the most effective for trauma symptoms are systematic exposure therapy, cognitive processing therapy, and eye movement desensitization, and reprocessing therapy. Let me briefly describe each one, but you should be able to find practitioners that use these different approaches and they're all sound, good science. Depending on the practitioner, they may or may not include new age elements, because a lot of practitioners do. But the approach itself is not necessarily informed by new age type thinking. It's just good science. So let me just tell you generally one thing about trauma treatment that I think is really important for us to understand. One of the classic symptoms and one of the most um, changeable symptoms of trauma is patterns of avoidance. People who have been traumatized learn how to avoid things that remind them of the trauma. I was just 12 years old. I 
attended a public grade school and I was trying to be popular like all kids were. And there was a group of girls that were kind of like the mean girls in that school. Do you know what I mean by that? Like the, just the clique of kind of cute girls, but they were also very mean and like bullies. And I really wanted to be included. I wanted them to like me. But unfortunately, it was hard to get in, you know? And one day they decided that they were going to really bully me. And they started to pick on me every day and just to sort of dog my steps. Everywhere I'd go, they'd just be there verbally assaulting me. But one day, they decided they would take it up a notch and they uh, accused me of taking another girl's boyfriend. Now, this boy was completely untouchable as far as I was concerned. I was like a little wallflower girl, you know, and he was definitely one of the cute guys, you know, and I would never have even spoken to him. I was terrified of these people. Never even talked to him, but they accused me of trying to take him away from this other girl. They just needed a lie to fuel what they wanted to do. So they took me, and they actually didn't drag me out. I have recently realized that they told me to come with them, and I went because I thought I didn't have a choice. And this is why when people are bullies to me now, I'm like, I'm not going because I have a choice now. I'm a big girl. I can say no. But I didn't know I could say no. And they led me out to this baseball diamond and pushed me down in the dirt, hiked my dress up over my body. I was a little right on the cusp of pubescent kid. I came to that school originally from a little podunk town in Ohio, and then it was Milwaukee we moved to. Milwaukee, Wisconsin is kind of a cosmopolitan area. And the first day of school, I showed up in a paisley dress with a bow and a big white collar and little white ankle socks and little shiny black shoes. And I thought I looked great. You know, I thought they're really going to be impressed with me. Well, it didn't work out that way. All the girls were wearing little short mini skirts and, and nylon stockings. And I was just marked from the beginning. So I had tried to conform to the fashion of that place and I'd come a little ways and I put on this cute little sweater dress that morning. It was a green and blue striped sweater dress that just fit my new little budding figure. I looked really cute, honestly. And I thought, you know, this is going to be a great day. They hiked that thing up over my body and they proceeded to physically and sexually abuse me. These girls with the, everybody on the playground watching. So from that point forward in my life, you know, there's a group of kind of cool people, and if I think they're talking to each other, or any kind of people with aggressive tendencies, if I think they're trying to talk to each other about me and like ganging up on me in any way, I go into orbit. It's just a trigger I have as a result of that experience growing up. And so one of the things that I have needed to do is go ahead and face those triggers. Because facing triggers is a really important part of trauma therapy. I do a whole trauma workshop. If any of you are interested, just reach out to me. I'm very easy to find. I'm going to be one of the first people they find during the time of trouble. You can find me. <laughs> JenniferJill.org. They'll find me. You'll find me. Everybody finds me. So anyway, reach out to me. You can do it through the website and ask about the trauma workshop. But I highly recommend it if you have some trauma history. It's a real simple six once a week workshop and you get materials and everything, and it's like a community model. But one of the most important things we do is we help structure people's program of facing triggers, because traumatized people avoid triggers. So my tendency would be to avoid situations where I think people are talking about me or gonna gang up on me. If I have any inkling of that, I'll just run the other way. But I have learned, and I'm learning how to face those things bravely. I call facing triggers, I call it courage training. And it also applies to anxiety disorders. We have to learn how to face the things we're afraid of rather than running from them. Now, one of the most important aspects of facing triggers is separating triggers and actual threats. So at the end of my driveway is a neighbor. Everybody in Florida has fences. And everybody in Florida has pit bulls, OK? And my, my neighbor had two pit bulls, and they had babies. And now he has about seven pit bulls. And they come stampeding up to that fence. One of them jumped over the fence into my other neighbor's yard and killed her favorite chicken. My neighbors are the ones that gave me the idea of having chickens. So we're way set back from the road, so they're never going to get into my property. But they're really mean dogs. 
Now say for instance I get attacked by a pit bull. I need to avoid pit bulls, right? Because that's an actual threat. But do I need to avoid pictures of pit bulls? No, because that's not an actual threat. But I'm gonna feel like it's an actual threat because it reminds me of the actual threat. That's the difference between a threat and a trigger. I have a fear of heights. I do rock climbing. I'm not someone who lets that limit me. But if I'm watching aerial footage of something, it'll just about kill me, you know? I'll be having like heart palpitations. So I made myself watch the movie. It's a documentary, it's called Free Solo, about, <laughs> what's his name? Do you know his name? This Alex something, this rock climber guy who free soloed without any gear, El Capitan, <laughs> which is this crazy rock face. And the footage on that movie was like, yeah, I was just dying, but I made myself watch it. It was a little rough sleeping that night because my adrenal glands get really cranked up by that. And it'll be a bit of a ride when you start facing your triggers. You know, it's not gonna be easy. What you do with these therapies is you face them gradually. And what your body will do for you is it will rehabituate itself. So with the first kind of therapy, systematic exposure, what you do is you find a middle point trigger and you face that trigger and you stay in that trigger until your body calms down because that's what your body does. It's when you run from it that your body stays heightened and reactive in the face of that trigger. But if you stay, say for instance, women in blue shirts really triggered me, right? So I would go to you and I would be here and I'd be talking to you and my heart would be going, <gasps> I'm afraid of women in blue shirts. But I would stay in the conversation until finally my body started saying, okay, I guess this isn't a threat. And now I've developed a new association between cute women in blue shirts and being calm, golden. This is great. So that's how that works. So that's called systematic exposure therapy where you gradually expose yourself to triggering situations. Has anyone here ever actually suffered PTSD that would be willing to say yes? Okay, legitimate PTSD will make you go out of your mind, like your adrenal gland, your adrenal system and your, you know, parents, or your sympathetic system will completely go out of the water and you will lose your ability to drive and do basic things. So it really is a retraining of the nervous system, but it can be done. Like people coming back from active combat, men who have faced unthinkable danger, watch their buddies get killed, fighting for their country, will come back with nervous system damage. These men are not crybabies. They're not thinking, oh, woe is me. I had something bad happen, and now I'm gonna be a case. They don't wanna go to a therapist. They don't wanna admit, they're because they're men, and they wanna be strong, but they have to admit, this is hard. I can't seem to get my nervous system to work. And they go to therapists doing this kind of thing, and they actually get help and things change for them. So you can retrain your nervous system, that's my point, and people that are highly trained to help you do that are really a blessing as far as I'm concerned. Then cognitive processing therapy is a type of cognitive behavioral, but what you do is re you review the narrative of the trauma, and while you're reviewing the narrative, your anxieties are gonna spike, and you stay in that narrative until your anxieties taper off. Journaling is a very powerful therapeutic exercise, and we go over that in detail in the workshop. And then eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, someone asked about that a couple days ago, is basically a method of bilateralizing your brain through eye movements that helps the brain process difficult material more effectively. And so eye movement desensitization and reprocessing can be a real blessing. Now, my computer went weird. Um, is there something I should do here? It's just showing the desktop. And I can't forward the slides without... What do I do? Oh, Mr. Spider, okay. So do you wanna just, can you get this to work again so I know it's coming or no? What, what do I click on? Okay, you're coming. So I talked about this yesterday, affect labeling. What do you do? Someone say, tell us. For those of you that weren't here, it's a study that was done on arachnophobia, extreme fear of spiders, and they tested several different approaches, including distraction techniques, cognitive reframing, and they found that just labeling your emotion 
in the moment that you experience that spike in anxiety was as effective, if not more effective, than the other approaches. So start by saying, I feel fill in the blank. I feel worried, I feel sad, I feel overwhelmed, I feel anxious, I feel terrified, I feel a sense of dread, I feel a sense of happiness, I feel a sense of apprehension. Fill in that blank and learn how to say, I feel fill in the blank. And Mr. Genius is coming up to help us get this show back on the road. What happened? Did I do something? Was it something I said? Oh, thank you. So I need to hit that proclaim button and then control, mm -hmm. and then it will come eventually? Yeah. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it, okay. We're having like some connection issues, aren't we? Mm -hmm. The internet isn't great here, is it? Yeah, okay, all right then. Click the next one, click the next one. Let's see here. Okay, yeah, there it is. Okay, so I wanna talk to you about this lady, this is an amazing, story because we're talking about trauma listen to this story this is i just read this lady's book she has a book called a rage less traveled in december of 2018 tour guide Kay wilson and her friend were attacked by arab terrorists in a jerusalem forest Kay's friend died but Kay lived and crawled to safety though bleeding from 13 stab wounds punctured lungs and diaphragm a dislocated shoulder broken shoulder blade and broken sternum isn't that amazing? Someone said at the end of the last session I did, I was talking about post-traumatic growth, that forgiveness is a big part of recovering from trauma. That's essentially what this lady is saying. She says, I believe with an imperfect faith in a God of justice who has promised that vengeance is his. The question is not why did this happen to me, but rather how can I incorporate this grisly event into the rhythm of my life in a manner that guards me from becoming like those who tried to murder me. People can come back from incredible trauma, can't they? And they can be a real blessing to the human race. So let me continue this. Let's talk for the next few moments about mindfulness, because that's one of the therapies that is used very often for different presentations, including trauma. So mindfulness is essentially being engaged in your present experience, self-observing in a non-judgmental manner. Mindfulness is basically self-awareness with the goal of self-regulation. Now, some of you are terrified right now because I used a Buddhist word. And I just wanna say that I check everything with scripture. I am not willing to embrace something just because it's scientifically validated. I wanna see if it's biblical, especially when it gets down to the core of who we are as people. So I, what I've done with mindfulness meditation is I have identified what I think are the effective elements of it. Because typically the world is right about some stuff. It may not be perfect, but if you scientifically validate something and test it, and it tests as being effective, there might be something in there that's from the throne of God. Let's not be on the defensive about everything. So I have identified these four things that I consider to be the effective aspects of mindfulness meditation. Number one, breathing, and I talked about that yesterday and we did a little breathing exercise together. That deep, slow breathing is very, very good for regulating emotions. Number two, focus. Now think about this for a moment because we're constantly being distracted, especially with all of our devices. So something rings over here, you look there, and then something over there, and then your phone goes off, and then this happens. And what happens is your eyes are going back and forth across the horizon. What kind of eye patterns do people have when they're in survival mode? They're like this. So they're in a constant alert state. And what that does is it reinforces that sense of apprehension and causes anxiety. When we have scattered focus like that, that is characteristic of survival mode, it keeps us in survival mode, i.e. anxiety. Because anxiety works for you when your life is threatened. So we tend to value things that work for us in a survival context because, hey, we lived because of that anxiety, so now it's gonna work for me every day of my life, right? No. That same thing that worked so well for you in that emergency context is gonna backfire on you if you keep in that mode for the rest of your life. Does that make sense? 
So what we need to do is start focusing because when you focus on something, you're basically telling yourself that the world isn't gonna fall apart without you. That you can afford to focus in on something and the rest of the world isn't go, gonna go haywire. So focus is a real important part of healthy meditation. Thirdly, recapturing of the imagination. Have you guys read the statement in the writings of Ellen White where she says that we should spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should let the imagination grasp each scene, especially what? The closing ones. I did an album years back when I was singing still called The Closing Scenes, and I tried to do this, help people help recapture their imagination by focusing on the closing scenes of Jesus' life. And then fourthly, mindfulness. And I just defined mindfulness a minute ago as being fully engaged in your present experience, self-absorbing, uh, self-observing, excuse me, in a non-judgmental manner. Mindfulness is basically self-awareness with a goal of self-regulation. So I told you about Jesus' meditations. Now I want to show you from Scripture how God teaches mindfulness in the Bible. See, Buddha got it from God. Everything good goes back to God. I had a client once. She was dealing with some bad behaviors, and she was a really good girl. But these bad behaviors would crop up every once in a while. And we couldn't figure out why. All of a sudden, she'd just reel out of control and things would happen. I told her, you are not defined by that bad behavior. Now, she's a very conscientious young lady and she wanted to do everything right, you know? And she was very cautious about being too easy on herself. But I told her, you know, the Bible teaches that you are not defined by your weaknesses and mistakes. You are defined by what God says you are. It's called the in Christ motif. You find it in the New Testament. And it says that we are all these things in Christ. And many of the things the Bible says that we are in Christ, we haven't really become yet in our day-to-day -day experience. I mean, we know what we will be. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he is. But then the Bible says, and everyone that hopes in him, that purifies himself as he is pure, you see. Um, think about Romans chapter 4. It says that Abraham wavered not in unbelief. What? There's no one in scripture that wavered in unbelief more flagrantly than Abraham. First of all, he gave his wife twice into the harem of a pagan king. And by the way, do you know how old she was? When the Pharaoh, uh, let me, sorry, the king of Bimelech, the king of the Philistines, took her into his harem? 90s. She was in her, nine, I think she was 90. She still had it. She was still harem material in her 90s. She, she had good genetics. I go, okay, you guys, stand up. You're really tired. Stand up. Get your, get your circulate, your blood going. I am almost done here. Almost done. Reach up to the ceiling. Touch your toes. I'll let you bend your knees, but don't bend it very much. Then go to the side to the side. Side to the side. And then be far enough away and get your, okay? All right, now sit down. Take a drink of water. We're almost done here. It's not because you're boring. Oh, I know. It's because you're white. That's the problem, most of you. <laughs> white people don't make, they don't make noise in church, and they don't realize that when you make noise in church, it helps you stay awake. <laughs> I had friends that were like, oh, you know, we should be quiet in church, and I'm like, it's better to fall asleep than make noise once in a while. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to be irreverent, but I just think there's something cultural happening. All right, so anyway, where, where was I? Okay, so this young lady was very conscientious, and she really wanted to not be presumptuous, but I told her, look, the Bible teaches that you are a new creature in Christ. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, past tense. So that means that if there's a sin in your life that keeps snagging you, God doesn't identify you by that sin. And she said, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't I have to overcome before God says, you know, that's not who you are? I said, no, it goes the other way. First you identify with who you are in Jesus, and then you have the wherewithal and the motivational power to let go of that thing. 
And she couldn't believe it. She couldn't accept it. And so I gave her a Bible study. <laughs> Romans chapter 7. Oh, there we go. Listen to what Paul says. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. If you look in the writings of Ellen White, she says what happened was Paul felt really good about himself, like he was a really religious person, right? He did everything right. He had a strong will. He was able to comply with all of the concrete standards of behavior, and he did just really well with that. But when he looked into the law sincerely, it showed him how sinful he was. I had a friend. She was like 95 years old, a beautiful woman. I just loved her. She had cataracts. She went to the doctor. She got the cataracts removed. She came back from surgery. I said, how'd the surgery go? She said, that doctor ruined my appearance. I said, what do you mean? She said, I can see myself now. I look awful. <laughs> but that's what happens with the law. Nothing changed on her face. Her face always had all those wrinkles on it. But her eyesight was clear. That's what Paul went through. His eyesight was clear because of the law of God. And she says that when he says sin became alive and I died, she says his self-esteem was gone. What expression do we use when someone's ashamed or embarrassed? I just died, I died, right? That crushing sense when your self-worth just falls apart. That's what that's describing. He saw himself for what he really was. And then he says, sin taking an opportunity through the commandment declare, deceived me and through it killed me. So I want to know how sin deceived him. Because he died when he saw himself. He was crushed with shame. He felt like it was completely unacceptable and God could never love him. God could never receive him into his presence. That he was a lost man. That's how he felt. And then it says that he got to that point because sin deceived him. Yes, sin will draw you into temptations and all that, but it will also shame you into oblivion. Sin loves to do that to people. He loves to do that to sincere believers. He loves to tell the most conscientious people on the face of the earth, you will be lost because you're imperfect. If he can't lead you into the world, he will torture you as a Christian. That's what he'll do. And so this is what's happening to Paul. It says that sin took an opportunity through the commandment and deceived him. So in what way did it deceive him? He says, so no, late, later in the passage, he says, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin that dwells in me. In other words, the way in which sin deceived him was to convince him, this is who you really are. You are your sin. This is inextricably bound up in your identity. And you better accept that right now. That's the devil telling you that. That's the enemy of all righteousness and all mental health telling you that, right? So no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. So he finally started to wrap his mind around the fact that this isn't really me. It's sin dwelling in me. And then he says, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin dwelling in me. So he says that twice. And then here's the sort of crescendo of the whole passage. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I what? What's that word? I what? I myself. So he's like, this is who I really am. I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. How many of you want to go on record saying, this is who I really am in Jesus. Raise your hand. Stand up and be counted. You are a new creature of Christ if you will just accept it. Amen. <laughs> I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. People get so distressed by that because they're like, it sounds like he's living a double life and he's fine with it. No, it just means that your flesh will always pull you toward the wrong, this side of eternity, and that's never going away until Jesus gives you a new body. That's not going away. You're always gonna be pulled that way, but you can identify with who you are in Jesus Christ. So I'm studying this with this girl to try to convince her that she can look at that pull towards sin in her life as sort of detached from her. She doesn't have to identify with it. And she says, wow. And she grasped it. And then I never heard from her again. She was calling all the time for therapy sessions and stuff. I guess it really worked. So thank God. And I want to leave you with that thought. So um, any questions or any contribution you want to make? Guys, God is so good. Amen. He's given us a way to be abundantly healthy and joyful and beat anxiety and depression and get past trauma. Uh, I could say something.
something. You could say something, okay. <laughs> he said, I could say testing, something. Testing, testing. Uh -huh. Testing, testing. Let me, maybe it turned off. That's possible. Things happen down here. Pass them on. Testing. Testing. Okay. Uh, on the subject you were ending with, which is an excellent place, um, I was looking in the council given us, and, uh, you know, we're told that the, the thought the temptation is not sin, but what we do with it, if we dwell on it and indulge in it, that is sin, and we're going to end up doing the whole thing if we do that. And the first thing the devil will do to try to get you to indulge in it is identify with this is who you really are. Yeah. This is what this is for you. Yeah. This is what defines yeah. you. Yeah. But if we will use thought stopping, and we'll just mm -hmm. say. No, mm -hmm. I know that's not right. Mm -hmm. That's not what God wants me to do. And go to Jesus, who is our high priest in mm -hmm. the most holy place, and ask him to help us. He has the power to help us control that which we would not have on our own. Mm -hmm. Amen. He has all power. Amen. So he can help us. And not that it won't come back, but we can gain a victory in that moment. Mm -hmm. And then the next moment, we can gain it again. Mm -hmm. And we keep getting stronger as we gain those victories. There's a learning curve. That's right. Very good. Thank you for that. Appreciate it so much. All right. Anybody else? Thoughts, questions, rebukes? You know, whatever you want to say. Oh, thank you. She's got her hand up. A thought went through my mind. I was watching Elizabeth Talbot, a DVD mm -hmm. of hers. Woohoo! Jesus wins. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Amen. She's uh, raising over there. You're getting your exercise, girl. You have to. This is a big gymnasium. Woohoo! Woo <laughs> <laughs>